All right. Let's get to the sermon. So any ideas of what I'll be preaching on today with that memory verse? Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So the title of the sermon is Repeat, uh, Repent Ye and Believe the Gospel. Repent Ye and Believe the Gospel. And you're probably wondering, Kevin, didn't you just preach on believing the gospel last week? Do we really need to hear another one on salvation? Well, I, I, in an ideal scenario, I wouldn't have to preach this sermon. But unfortunately, there are so many false doctrines out there, so many false gospels out there that I just, I'm forced but to preach this. Okay. Now, you might say, Kevin, isn't the word repentance, isn't repentance a major doctrine in the Bible? Yes, it is. And is it related to the gospel? Is it, is it related to salvation? Absolutely, it is. So the natural question is, well, why, don't you, why didn't you mention repentance last week when you preached that salvation was by grace, through faith, and not of works? Well, because the basis of that you know, sermon was really coming from the book of John. And it, what did we say about the book of John? The book of John is a book that was written to the unbeliever so they would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, be saved and receive eternal life. And it's interesting that in that book that's written for salvation, the only book that's purposely written for salvation, according to the Bible, does not mention the word repentance once. Not once. Okay? So that's why I didn't mention it, because I didn't want to confuse anyone. And the topic of repentance has such great confusion in our world today, such great confusion in our churches today, that I have no choice but to preach a totally separate sermon just on repentance. In fact, I received an email today from a friend of mine who's messed up on repentance. It was a long email. I haven't even got, I got through like two paragraphs so far. It's super long. I need, I need time to dedicate to it. But basically, he's just messed up on repentance, thinking that someone has to turn from their sins. And we'll talk about that, that phrase soon. But he believes you have to turn from your sins in order to be saved. Now, some people will say, well, Kevin, you don't believe in repentance. If you don't believe someone has to turn from their sins to be saved, you don't believe in repentance. No, I absolutely believe in repentance, right? God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Okay? Now, before Jesus came, before, well, actually, while Jesus was on the earth, but before he started his ministry, John the Baptist, his cousin, who was a little bit older than him, okay, maybe six months older, I think, came and what did he preach? I'll read it to you from Matthew chapter 3 verses 1 and 2. It says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So what was the message of John the Baptist? Who came to prepare the way of the Lord, remember? He came to prepare the way of Jesus Christ. He came teaching, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now I just want you to notice as we, as we read these verses, did he say, repent of your sins, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand? He didn't say that, did he? He just said, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then came Jesus, next chapter in Matthew, chapter 4, verse 14. From that time, Jesus began to preach. So now Jesus begins to preach, right? And to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So did Jesus come preaching repentance? Yes, he did. But did he say, repent of your sins, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand? No, he didn't. Then, what did Jesus do? He got 12, right? 12 disciples, the 12 apostles that we're familiar with. We read about it in Mark chapter 6, verse 7. I'll read it to you. It says this, And he called unto him the 12, and began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits. So, by the way, this is why, you know, we, when we go and preach the gospel door to door, we go two by two. Right? We take the practice that we see Jesus Christ sending His twelve two by two and gave them power over unclean spirits. And then in verse 12 it says this, And they went out and preached that men should repent. All right, So now Jesus is getting His disciples, His followers, that are preaching the same message as Him. They came and preached that men should repent. So did the disciples preach repentance? Yes, they did. Did they preach you have to repent of your sins? That's not what the Bible says, right? They just went out preaching that men should repent. And so when we go out and preach the gospel as a church, we ought to teach men that they too should repent, right? And they too should repent. So do we as a church and do I as an individual believe in repentance? Yes, I do. Now, let's go back to the Greek. <laughs> 
<laughs> Let's go back to the Greek, because in a topic like this, you have to go back to the Greek, right? Because people are going to tell you, well, this is the definition of repentance. And they're going to give you a definition that doesn't match up with the word repentance at all. Okay? So we have to go back to the Greek. We'll go back to the English as well, don't worry. Back, back to the Greek. There are three main ways that, uh, three main Greek words that we get the word repentance from. Now, the most popular one, the most common one is metanoia. Metanoia. The other one is meta, and forgive me if I pronounce it, it's all messed up, but the other one is metanoo, and then metanoeo. Okay? Now, why three different words almost sounding exactly the same? It's kind of like, the, you know, repentance, repented, repenting. You know, we got different English words to say the same thing, just depending on the grammar. So, the same thing with the Greek, depending on the grammar, the way you pronounce it is a little bit differently. But going back to the Greek, metanoia, the main word that we use, basically means this. Meta, we use that word in English, right? When we think of the word metamorphosis, right? We talk about metamorphosis, we talk about a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. What's happening to it? It's changing, right? It's changing from one form to another form. Or maybe a tadpole to a frog. Metamorphosis taking place from that tadpole. It's growing its legs and it's losing its tail and it's becoming a frog. Metamorphosis, right? So it's a change. A change. That's where we get the, me the word meta from. Or you think about you know, your, your metabolism. Metabolism. We talk about eating food, right? And the cells in your body, what do they do to the food? They change the food into you know, energy. Into so a source, a fuel source for it to grow. So it changes uh, food into energy. That's why it's called your metabolism. That's where the word meta comes from, right? So it's a change. Something's changing. And then the word noia, meta noia. What's noia? Okay, well, in English, we have the word paranoia, right? Paranoia. So it's about the mind. It's what you think about. It's being para When you talk about someone's being paranoid, it's they give a lot of thought to things that might be harmful to them or, or fearing things, you know, about, you know, I don't know. But paranoia, it comes out that same word noia is where you get metanoia from. So what is metanoia? Going back to the Greek, it's changing your mind. Meta, change, noia, mind. Change your mind. Does it mean turn from your sins? No, right? Just going back to the Greek, right? And I don't know Greek. I couldn't speak a sentence of Greek to you, so I'm not here trying to pretend anything, right? Now, the word repent in English. The word repent in English. Going back to the etymology of the word. Now, the word starts with the word, the letters R-E, re right? Where we get the word, where we get, sorry, repeat from, right? When you read something, when you repeat something, now this doesn't apply to every word that starts with re, because you've got read, right? But re often as a prefix means to repeat, to do it again, okay? Replenish, you know, fill that cup again, replenish, repeat, do it again and again. Then you've got the word pent, repent. Where does the word pent come from? It comes from, right, think of the English word pensive. If I say that person looks very pensive, what am I saying? That person's in deep thought, right? And even in the Spanish, we have the word pensar, which is to think. That's where the same root words come from. Pensar is to think. So if you say someone's pensive, or I say in Spanish pensar, we're saying they're thinking. So what does repent mean? Rethink, right? Change your mind. Change mind, rethink, however you want to say it, that's what repent means. Now, repentance doesn't always mean turning from something bad to something good. You can rethink anything. You know, I was at, um, uh, near my house in Sydney, they opened up a uh, Costco, all right, Costco, and I really wanted to check it out because it's bulk, bulk items at discount prices. And I went there, I think it was maybe even the opening day or the second day I went, I drove to Costco, and then I had to look, there were massive crowds, there were just so many people there. And guess what I did? I repented. <laughs> I didn't go to Costco that day, I went to Aldi or something <laughs> right, to get things. But I repented. Now, did I repent of my sins? No. Was it sinful to go to Costco, to think about going to Costco? No, it wasn't, right? You just changed your mind. And in Spanish, you know, people use the word repent all the time, you know, in Spanish. Because they're always, you know, thinking of doing this and then they change their mind and do something else, right? 
And so we lose the definition in English and people will tell you and try to trick you into believing it's something that it's not because we don't use the word repent. We, it's lost its use in our modern English language. But in places all around the world, in different languages, they use repent all the time in, the, in their language. So it doesn't always mean turning from something bad to something good. Let me give you a biblical example of this. Go to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 13, if you've got your Bibles. Exodus chapter 13. Verse 17. Exodus 13, verse 17. The Bible reads, And it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let, let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines. Although that was near, for God said, Lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. So this, is when, this takes place when Israel is delivered out of Egypt. God could have taken them through the, the land of the Philistines. God could have done that. It would have been closer. It would have been more direct. But because it was a land of war, or they might have, made, they might have had war against the, um, the, the, the Israelites, God says, look, we're not going to take them that way. We're going to take them another way in case they repent, in case they, in case they decide to go back to Egypt, right? So it would have been a bad thing to repent, right? It would have been a bad thing to go back to Egypt after God had already delivered them out of Egypt. So you can repent from bad to good, you can repent from good to bad, or you can just repent from neutral to neutral. It doesn't matter because the word repent does not carry the meaning of something bad or good or good or bad. It just means to change your mind over anything. Okay? Yes. Now, some people will say to you, well, repentance means to turn from your sin. Right? They say repent means to turn from your sin. And that's why when they preach a gospel and they see the word repent in the Bible, they automatically define that as turning from your sins. But I'll tell you why that's completely ridiculous to believe that repentance means to turn from your sin. It's because the person that repents most in the Bible, more than anyone in the Bible, is God Himself. So if God can repent, it must be something that God can do. So if you say repentance means turning from your sins, then what you're saying indirectly is that God turns from his sins more than anyone else in the Bible. Now, does God have sin? No, in him there's no darkness at all, right? God is light. God has no sin. God is perfect. God is holy. And if God can repent, that automatically means it cannot mean a turning from sin because God cannot turn from sin. God has no sin. It's impossible for him to do it. Right? And Genesis 6, 6, you don't need to turn there, I'll just read it. This is the first mention of the word repent. And who repents? And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him in the heart. So the first time the word repent is used, many people have this, this idea that, you know, you can go back to the first use of the word. It's called the first mention principle, I think, and get a good understanding of what that word means. And that's largely true. I don't think that's always true, but that's largely true. And so what we see here is that the Lord repented. He created man, remember? And then they were so wicked that God wanted to destroy them. He repented God that He had made man because they were so wicked. And that's where we get the flood of Noah and the story of Noah and the ark. Okay, so in context of salvation. So repent just means, it just means change your mind. It just means change. It just means turn, right? Now, it's the context that's going to define what someone's turning from. I had to tell you the story about Costco so you knew the context of my repentance, that I had gone from one store to another store. Otherwise, you'd be thinking, oh, did Kevin turn from his sins? What sins did he commit that day? Right? It's the context that determines everything. It's the context that determines understanding that the Lord repented because he was unhappy. He, was, uh, he had changed his mind. He grie grieved him that he made man on the earth because I was so wicked. It's the context that determines everything. If you said to me, Kevin, what do I need to do to be saved? And I just said, believe. And I just said, believe, that's it, believe. You'll be like, believe what? Give me the context. Is it believe on Santa Claus to be saved? Is it believe on Kevin? Is it believe on, on the, you know, the church in Caloundra to be saved? No, that's why we say believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to tell you what it is that you have to believe to be saved, right? And so repentance is similar. You need to give people the context of what it is they need to repent. Now, is it true that unbelievers to be saved have to repent? 
Yes. But is it true that believers, once they're saved, have to repent as well? Yes. It all depends on the context. Your life ought to be a life of repentance, okay? Your life ought to be a life of repentance. It all comes down to the context, okay? Because the word is heavily used in the Bible. So I believe in repentance. Now, the next question might be, Kevin, do you believe you have to repent of your sins? Yes, I do. I do believe you have to repent of your sins. You might say, do you, have to be, do you believe you have to be willing to turn from your sins? Yes, I do. Some people say repentance is sorrow. Do you believe you should be sorrowful for your sins? Yes, I do. But I don't believe any of those things are required for salvation. Repentance is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. So basically, it's turning from whatever you were believing before to believing on Christ. That's the context of salvation in the gospel. We know what the gospel is. We know what salvation is, right? We, we learned last week, it's by grace, through faith, and not of works. So when you use repentance in context of salvation, it must be consistent with that definition. It cannot be contradictive to that definition, right? It must be. It must be. It must be by grace, through faith, believing on Christ, and not of works. So whatever you define repentance for salvation must line up perfectly with that. Amen. Otherwise, God is contradictive and we can't trust His Word. It must line up perfectly. So in context of salvation, what are we repenting to? So usually when you repent, usually when you change your mind or you turn from one thing, you turn from one thing and you turn to another thing, right? That's usually what happens. I turn from Costco and I turn to Aldi, right? That's what happens when you repent. So when it comes to salvation, what are you repenting to? Turn with me to Acts, well, you don't need to, it's your memory verse. I'm going to go with your memory. Don't turn there, so it's in your head. Acts chapter 20, verse 21, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. And by the way, is this just to Jews and Greeks? I mean, is this not to Australians also? <laughs> you know, quite often when you read your Bible, you'll see the word Greeks. And quite often that just means everyone that's not a Jew. All right? Because, yes, it has to do with the Greeks, but also because Greek was the international language at that time. All right? Um, it, was, it was a language that was spoken by a lot of nations so they could trade with one another. And so by Greeks, they really mean those that speak Greek. Okay? It's those that are, are, are non-Jews. So it's the same message to the Jews and to the Greeks. No, the Jews don't have their own special covenant. All right? And the Greeks have a special no. It's the same teaching for both the Jews and the Greeks. Repentance toward God, right? It's toward God, toward our Savior, and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you, do you notice they're both pointing to someone? Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, some people will mess this up and say, see, there's two steps to salvation. There's repentance, which I'll define repenting of sins. And then there's faith. Come on. It's toward, right? You're doing something toward. It's phrasing the same thing twice. It's repentance toward God. And who's Jesus Christ? Is he not God? <laughs> yes, Jesus Christ is God. So it's repentance toward God. And it's faith. So here, repentance being defined as faith. Faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. It's just phrasing the thing twice, so to give you just more understanding of what is being taught here. But here's the thing. Anyone that wants to teach you works salvation are going to find verses, and they're going to twist it and wrestle with it and preach. It doesn't matter what the Bible says. They're going to find something to preach the false heresies. Does it say you have to repent of your sins here? No, it doesn't. It just says repentance toward God, further defined as faith toward our God, our Lord Jesus Christ, right? So what are we repenting to? We're repenting to Jesus Christ. We're trusting Him alone for salvation. We, we understand He died for our sins. We understand he, had that, he paid the sacrifice. He paid the debt to God. And we're just trusting Him. We're putting all our faith upon Him alone for salvation. That's what repentance is. That's what we're repenting to for salvation. Now the question is, well, what are we repenting from? If we're repenting to Jesus Christ, what are we repenting from? We're repenting from sins. No. <laughs> no. That's not what the Bible says. Number one, you're repenting. If you're believing, what did you not do before? You didn't believe, right? You're turning from unbelief. Mark chapter 1, verse 14 to 15 says this. Now, after that, John was put in prison. This is John the Baptist. 
After that, John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel. So what did Jesus come preaching? Preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Repent ye and believe the gospel. So what are you repenting from? Not believing the gospel, right? Repent from not believing the gospel. Believe the gospel. Does it say here, repent from your sins? No. And I'm going to keep saying that, okay? It doesn't say that. It says, repent ye and believe the gospel. So you're repenting from unbelief. You're repenting from not believing the gospel to believe in the gospel. That's what Jesus came preaching. And then in Acts, another one, Acts 19 verse 4. This is about Paul. And then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance. So this baptism of repentance that John the Baptist was doing. What is this about? Let me just read it again. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him that should come after him. That is on Christ Jesus. So what is the baptism of repentance? What was John the Baptist preaching? Believe on him which should come after him on Christ Jesus. So what? You weren't believing on Christ Jesus? Repent. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So the repentance is a repentance from unbelief. Now what else does someone repent of in order to be saved? Is there anything else? Yes, there's, there's obviously unbelief, but there's other things. Turn, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1. This is an instruction to believers. It says he, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, let us go unto perfection. So he's saying, look, we're saved. We've got the fundamental doctrines. Now let's go on. Let's learn more. Let's be more perfect. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, and of faith toward God. So it's saying, look, we don't need to go back to the basic foundational principles, which were repentance from dead works, right? So what is it, guys, when we go knock doors and we say, are you sure of heaven? People say, I'm pretty sure, or I know I'm sure. What do nine out of 10 people say when they say that? What are they trusting in? Their works, their good deeds, they're good works, right? I'm a good person. I've helped my neighbor. I've done good things. So in order to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, someone has to repent from their works, repent from their dead works, repent from trusting their works to get them to heaven. They're dead works, by the way, because it's without faith. It's dead works. It's, it's filthy rags to God. They think, they think it's so good. It's dead and it's filthy rags to God. And they need to believe the gospel. They need to put their trust on Jesus Christ, not their trust on their works, right? Because naturally, if someone's going to put all their faith on Jesus Christ, that would mean that whatever faith they had before on anything else, you know, that needs to be repented of, right? So you need to repent from trusting your works. That's something else you need to repent from. What else do we need to repent from? Turn with me to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. What else are we required to turn from? Oh, certain people. Because this might not describe you. This might only describe some people. Acts chapter 17, verse 29 to 31. Acts chapter 17, verse 29. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone or graven by art or man's device. So is God a, an idol? Is he something that God, that man can create? Some statue or some idol? No, he's not. Okay, we not, ought not to think of God that way. Okay, and that's where the Roman Catholics get this wrong. And they get lots of things wrong, but this is one major thing they get wrong. They try to describe God as an image or as a statue. No, we ought not to think of God in that way at all. Verse 30, And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. So what do we need to repent from? According to the context 
of Acts 17 of the idols that we just read about. Verse 31, because he have appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man, that man referring to Jesus, whom he have ordained, whereof he have given assurance unto all men in that he have raised him from the dead. So the teaching here that uh, Paul is saying is those that are trusting in idols, false gods, false depictions of who God is, God is requiring these people and commending these people to repent from those idols, repent from their false gods, repent from their false religion, repent from trusting in false gods to get them to heaven, to trust in the one that's going to judge them, Jesus Christ. Right? Good. So someone to be saved in order to put all their faith on Jesus has to turn from Allah, has to turn from, I don't know, what other false gods are there? I don't even know their names. You know, false gods out there. Um, Buddha. Buddha. Is that a god or just an enlightened person? Buddha, Allah, um, you know, the Roman Catholic Mary. They need to repent from these idols, repent from these false gods, and we put all their faith on Jesus Christ, right? Amen. So, are there things we need to repent from? Yes. These are the only things that are in the Bible that I can find. I went through every reference of repentance in context of salvation. And these are the three things that you need to turn from. Okay, everyone needs to turn from unbelief because we all need to believe on Christ. Some people need to turn from trusting their works. Right, my kids don't trust their works because, you know, they've grown up here in the gospel. They know works are going to save them. But a lot of people out there trust in their works. And those that believe in false gods, you know, that again, didn't grow up in a Christian home, believe in false gods or false faith, false church, they need to repent from that as well. Why? Because they need to put all their faith on Jesus Christ. Good. Now, someone will say, ah, we've got him. We've got you. Isn't unbelief a sin? Isn't believing in false gods a sin? You know, isn't believing in works a sin? Yes, all those things are sins. Okay, they are. I admit that. Okay. So you've got to turn from your sins to be saved. <laughs> Come on. Now look, first of all, if you're going to put your faith, if you're going to repent and put your faith on Jesus, okay, this is, kids, please, I, I know you understand this, so I'm talking to you guys. If you put your faith on Jesus, does that mean your faith is on anything else? If you put all your faith on Jesus? No. Okay. So just the act, the act of putting your faith on Jesus will automatically mean You've turned from those things. You've turned from those sins automatically. You know, it's not a separate step. You put your faith on Jesus Christ, all of it, it means you've left those other things that you're trusting in and you've left unbelief. Okay. Now, here's what happens. People are going to take passages like, like this and say, see, there are sins you have to turn from. Therefore, you have to turn from drunkenness. Therefore, you have to turn from fornication. Therefore, you have to turn from lying. Therefore, you have to turn from stealing. Do you see how people now start adding the works of the law to salvation? Okay, none of those things are found in these scriptures. Repenting from sin is a phrase that's not found in your Bible. It's found in the Book of Mormon. If you want to be a Mormon, yeah, okay, repent your sins, fine. But it's not found in the Bible. And the sins that you turn from are simply those that are preventing you from putting your faith on Christ. So you don't have to keep the works of the Lord. And I'll explain that to you because they'll say to you, no, it's not works. We'll get there. We'll get there. Now here's, now really, I mean, honestly, that's repentance. How long did this sermon take? Um, didn't take too long. All right. I, I should be able to just wrap up now, close our Bibles, sing our last song and go soul winning, right? We should be able to do that because we know what repentance now is, right? It's a change of mind. Believing on Jesus Christ from whatever you were believing before, right? We're done. We should just wrap it up right now. Finished. But I've got to cover the false repentances out there. And I've already covered some of the turning from your sins. That's the main one out there. To repent or to turn from your sins. They'll say repentance means to turn from your sins. Even though that phrase does not appear once in your Bible. It does not appear. And remember on Thursday I spoke to you about being very careful about using words that describe your salvation or the gospel with words that are not in the Bible. Because you add confusion. There's a reason why God's got His words laid out. There's a reason why it's pure and perfect and preserved. Because God wants us to use His words. God wants us to use His phrases as found in the Bible. And not these man-made phrases that add confusion. Okay? And it doesn't appear once. Why use a phrase that doesn't appear in the Bible? Aren't we supposed to go back to the Word of God and check everything that we hear? 
if it's not in the Bible, how can I check it's in there? Like, how can I check what you're saying is true? In fact, that's why I know what you're saying is not true, because it's not in the Bible, right? Amen. Now, what is sin? We're all sinners. We've all come short of the glory of God. What does it mean to sin? Please turn to 1 John 3, 4. 1 John 3, 4. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. I want you to have this fixed in your mind. What is sin? It's important. Okay, especially when you're talking to people that teach you have to turn from your sins to be saved. The Bible tells us the definition of sin. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4 says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin, here's the definition, for sin is the transgression of the law. So if you sin, it means you've transgressed, it means you've violated, it means you've broken the laws of God. If God says, Thou shalt not bear false witness, that means lying, and you've lied, guess what? You've transgressed the law of God. It means you've sinned, and that makes you a sinner. So to sin is to transgress the law of God. Now, should we try to keep the law of God? Absolutely. Okay, but we've all failed. We've all sinned. We're all sinners. We've all transgressed and broken or violated the law of God. Now, very simple. Kids, I'm talking to the kids because you guys get it. All right, you guys get this. If I say that sinning is breaking the law, okay? And then I say to you to be saved, or someone says to you to be saved, you have to repent or turn from sins. What are they really saying? What are they really saying? So if sin is transgressing the law, breaking the law, and they say, well, to be saved, you have to turn from your sins, you have to stop transgressing, what are they actually saying? It means you have to keep the law. You have to keep the law of God. That's what they're saying. They're just saying it in a different way. They're using a phrase that's not in the Bible so they can trick people to fool people to make them believe a false gospel. All right? Now, we're an independent Baptist church. I make no apologies for that. Right? Unfortunately, there are independent Baptist churches right now teaching people that they have to keep the law for their salvation. Now, they're not saying you've got to keep the law, but they're saying you've got to repent of your sins, right? Because any person in that congregation, if they heard the preacher get up and say, you've got to believe on Jesus Christ and keep the law, stop transgressing the law, people in that congregation will stand up immediately and say, this is a works-based gospel. They'll say, heresy. They'll say, get back to preaching the true gospel. And so these preachers have to be very clever, just like the devil, very subtle in the way they teach things and say, well, you've got to repent of your sins. I didn't say you've got to keep the law, but you've got to repent of your sins. You've got to stop transgressing the law is what they're saying. Okay. Now, uh, I'll just cover this very quickly. There are two different types of sins. Okay. There's the sin of commission. Commission comes away from committed. There are sins that you commit. Sins of commission. So if, if God says thou shalt not lie and you've told a lie, it means you've committed a sin. Right. There are sins of commission. You've done something wrong. And then there's the sin of omission. The sins of omission. To omit something is to take away from. Uh, James 4.17 explains this. It says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So there is sin that we can do where we're not actually um, committing. We're not actually doing something wrong, but it's something good that we can do, but we don't do it. For example, we should read our Bibles. Now, if you don't read your Bibles, guess what? You're sinning. Okay, because you're omitting that commandment that we ought to read God's word. Okay, so the sins of commis commission, wrong that you do, and sins of omission, good that you don't do. Okay, and some people say there's a third one. They'll say it's the sins of disposition. And that's where basically it's not an outward showing. It's like internal things. Like you might hate your brother without a cause. And they'll say, well, that's a sin of um, uh, disposition. Now, I think, I, I, I just, I like, commission and omission because I think even sins of disposition can also apply to commission and omission. I won't go into all that. But this is how the repent of your sins people try to trick you. They'll say, no, we're not telling you to be good. We're not telling you to do good. We're not telling you to do the sins, to, um, uh, the sins of omission, right? Where you, know, you ought to do good to one another. We're not saying that. We're just saying stop doing the bad. Stop, turn from your sins, the sins of commission. And that's where they confuse this. But it doesn't matter if it's the sins of commission or the sins of omission. It's still the law of God, right? And you're still asking people to keep the law to be saved. I mean, that's going to breed confusion amongst people, right? It's paid for. Salvation has been paid for 
in Jesus Christ. Stop messing it up. So Romans chapter 3, verse 24 to 28. I'll just read there. Romans chapter 3, verse 24 to 28. The Bible says, Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So it's, we're freely justified. Whom God have sent forth to be a propiti propitiation through faith, right, through believing in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time, His righteousness. So God, the reason why it's a free gift through the shed blood of Christ is to declare His righteousness, not our own righteousness, not our efforts at keeping the law, not our efforts at stopping sin or turning from sin. It's to declare the righteousness of God, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, that He might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? Do we boast about our salvation? No. It is excluded by what law? Of works? Is it the law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. By faith without the deeds of the law. Okay? So it's not that these people that teach, you know, salvation is repenting of sins by the deeds of the law. It's not that, well, they're just a little bit mix, mix, mixed up. No, they're not even justified by the Lord because they're mixing works with faith. And man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And so please don't think, well, they're just my brother. And, then, and look, they can be, all right? They, they can be mixed up. I get it. But you should automatically, as soon as people are saying to you that, you know, uh, you've got to turn or repent from your sins to be saved, automatically your, your mindset should go, I need to get this person saved. Yeah. Now, it is possible, it is possible they were saved, truly saved, and they just mixed up, all right? But you can't, you don't know that. You can only judge them by what they're saying right now. Right. And so if you love them, then you ought to tell them, hey, salvation's not by works, not by repenting of sins. It's freely received justification through faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, some will say, still say no, it's not works. And, and the best one, I think, is Jonah 3.10. A lot of you people know it. Jonah 3.10, this is when God was going to destroy Nineveh, Nineveh for, their, for their wickedness, right? And God sends Jonah, you know the story of Jonah being swallowed by the whale. God sends Jonah to come and preach against them, to preach judgment against them. Jonah didn't even tell them, clean, up, clean yourselves up, you know, get right with God. No, Jonah said, I'm, God's going to destroy you. <laughs> All right, but th they took that so seriously. They were so afraid by God's judgment. They, at least they had a fear of God in them. Jonah 3.10, and, they, and they, they, they clean themselves up. They turn from their wickedness. And then it says this, And God saw their works, they, that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that He had said that He would do unto them, and He did it not. So two things here. This, this city of Nineveh, very good, very good of them to turn from their wicked ways. But God says, hey, I saw their works. So turning from your evil way, turning from your sins is works according to the Holy Ghost, who's the narrator of the Bible, okay? According to, according to, are you going to listen to God at least and, and acknowledge that turning from sins is works? Can we at least believe God, right? But then who repented? And God repented of the evil that He said He would do unto them, and He did it not. So, is, did God turn from His sins? No, right? We've got two things in this verse clearly explaining that repenting or cleaning up your life from wickedness is works. Number one. And number two, that God repentant, therefore it cannot be clean, turning from sin. Because God has no sin. And the most recent one I've heard, you know where I, where I just said repentant, repenting from your sins is not found in the Bible? Well, one pastor came up with this one. Yes, it is. It's, it's found in Luke 24 verse 47. Maybe if you want to turn there, just in case that way if you hear it, at least you know the answer. <laughs> Luke 24 verse 47. And that repentance, okay, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So there you go. There's repenting of sins because it says, and that repentance and remission of sins. There it is. No, I've heard that. <laughs> I'm serious. I've heard that. There it is. There's the repentance of your sins. Now, case closed. There's repentance. <laughs> now, it, do we need to have our sins remitted of? You know, yes. Uh, being, you know, rem, uh, remittance is 
what's the word? Um, it's to be like discharged. Um, uh, I've, I've lost the words in my head. But basically, it's been free from your sins, okay? And so, yes, we, I believe in repentance and I believe in the remission of your sins. But how do we receive remission of sins? Does it say you have to repent of your sins to have that? To have remission of sins? No, it doesn't. Okay? But Matthew 26 verse 28 says this. For this is, my, this is Jesus speaking. This is Jesus speaking. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So how do we have our sins remitted of? Through the blood of Jesus Christ. Through the blood of the New Testament. Not from repenting of your sins. Okay. And then Acts 10 verse 43 says, To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. So how do we have our sins remitted of? By believing on Jesus Christ through his shed blood. Not by you trying to keep the law and turning from your sins. Okay. Now, the other, let me th throw some other things at you. They'll say, yep, you've got to repent of your sins. Then they're wrong. And then they'll say at the same time, I don't, know, I don't know how they do this, but they're so messed up, they're so blinded. And then they'll say this, repentance means turn from your sins. Okay. So they'll say repentance. So they, they say, well, I don't have to show you where it says repent of your sins because repentance means turn from your sins. You heard that one, right? They'll say that. Now, if that's true, then they can't even speak English. I mean, they can't even get their grammar right. Because if repentance means turn from your sins, then why do you say repent of your sins? Why? Do you say repent of your sins of your sins? Is that, in, is that, does that make any sense? If I said believe means believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, then can I say re believe on the Lord Jesus Christ if believe already means believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Otherwise, I'd be saying believe on the Lord Jesus Christ of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see, and it doesn't even make grammatical sense. It breaks all the English laws of grammar. It breaks the sentence structure. All right. Next thing they'll say, well, all right, you don't have to turn from all your sins. But you've got to turn from being a habitual sinner. Oh. <laughs> what does that mean? You know, when they start saying, you can, you can never ask them. You, wanna, cause these are, you should ask them, what do you mean? What is a habitual sinner? Right? Oh, well, you know, if you're fornicating, you've got to stop that. You, if you're living with your girlfriend, you can't just keep living with your girlfriend. Right? To, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But what is, if, look, what is a habitual sinner? If, if, I, if I got drunk every day, if I just drank alcohol every day and got drunk, would you say I'm a habitual drunkard? Yeah, of course you would, right? If I smoked a cigarette every day, just one cigarette, not a whole pack, just one. Just one. If I smoked a cigarette every day, would you say I'm a habitual smoker? You would say that, right? Right? If you drank a coffee every day, you need a coffee every day. Are you a habitual drinker of coffee? You are, right? Something you do every day means you're, you're, you do it out of habit. You do it every day. You do it every day of your life. Now look, are we going to sin every day of our life? Yeah. Yes. You sin every, if you're honest with yourself, you will sin every day of your life. Every day. Every single day from the time you committed your first sin to the time you die, guess what? You will commit sin every single day of your life. Does that not make you a habitual sinner? Of course it does. So if you're saying, hey, you've got to stop being a habitual sinner, what are you saying? You're pretty much saying you've got to be perfect, right? It's impossible. Everyone is a habitual sinner. Those that think they've turned from habitual sin are the biggest hypocrites on the planet. They too are habitual sinners. Ah, and then, what else can I talk about? <laughs> All right, another one. When I first came across this topic, I was, I was ignorant. I used to hear people say it. I didn't really think of what they were saying. I just thought they believed the same as I did. And then what really made me notice this is I started going soul winning. I started to give out tracts, right? We call them leaflets because I want to, you know, tracts sometimes sounds too religious. People don't know what you're giving them. Um, but the first tract I looked at, um, it's called the Stop Tract. It's pretty common amongst IFB churches in Australia. But it was, it's pretty good. It's a really good tract. It's got images. It really gives a visual description of what's going on with salvation. But then one of the questions is, you know, in order for you to sort of move on and understand the gospel, it says, are you, do, no, are you, will, I can't remember exactly, do you want to turn from your sins or are you willing to turn from your sins? Something like that. And I remember looking at that and going, oh, what do you mean? Uh, we're all sinners. We will continue sinning. What do you mean? Uh, I didn't have to turn from my sins to be saved. I just believed on Jesus Christ. 
Anyway, this pastor that put this track together, and I, I know, I know this man's is saved. I, like, well, at least I know he, I, he knows the true gospel because I've heard him preach before. The pastor that put this together is an Australian pastor. And so what I did was, he actually has a video, videos on YouTube on how to use his stop tract, how to give out the gospel using that tract. And he goes step by step through the tract, how to give it. So he goes step by step. And when he gets to that part where it says, you know, do you want to turn from your sins? He says in his video, but of course we know that nobody can truly turn from their sins. It's like, then why put it in the tract? If you know this is something nobody can do, you know it's impossible, why put it in the tract? Because now you're making salvation impossible. You're asking them to do something that they cannot do. And he knows it. But he still puts it in. And this is what blows my mind. I'm fine with the church that teaches you've got to repent of your sins if they're just open and honest about it. If they're just, you know, yep, it's not just believe. That's not enough. You also have to turn from your sins. You know, just as much as the Roman Catholics, yep, it's not believe. You've got to do the works. You've got to go to church and, be, you know, confess your sins to the priest. I can respect that to some extent. Yes, they are teaching a false gospel, but they're at least being honest about it, right? So you know that's a false church. I'm not going to that church. Yeah. But it, I hate it when churches try to tell you that by faith alone, they believe it's faith on Jesus Christ alone, and even maybe their websites and the doc, you know, different things they have, the same of faith has it, but then you go and behind the pulpit, they're teaching you've got to turn from your sins to be saved. Yeah. I hate that. That's such a, this, so deceptive. Just be honest. Just, I wish all the IFB churches, all the independent Baptist churches in Australia would just say, all right, we believe in repenting of your sins. We believe you have to turn from your sins to be saved. Fine, be honest. And those that say, hey, no, it's just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Just say it and just, just split. Just be honest. Just say, hey, we believe the gospel by faith and we believe it's repenting of your sins. Fine, do what you believe. Go with it. Go with it. You know, whatever you want. But just be honest. So we're not stuck in the middle trying to work out what do you really believe, All right? Amen. What do I really believe? It's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's faith alone, by grace, through faith, not of works, not by the works of the law, okay? It's believe, and I don't ever want to, look, I, we need to be wise, wise as serpents, harmless as doves. There are Christians out there that will say, repent of your sins, but they don't mean what a lot of these other people do, I can't mean, right? Some people really do when they say repent of your sins, where they say, well, you've got, you got to turn from your false idols, like we talked about. You've got to turn from your unbelief. That's what I mean. I don't mean you have to stop, you know, getting drunk and stop fornicating. You know, fine. You know, these people know the truth, but I always challenge them. But then why do you use a phrase that confuses people? Why do you use a phrase that's not in the Bible that confuses people? You know, we knock doors and you know, every time they say repent, they mean turn from sins. The most, you know, the most common understanding of repentance is to turn from sins. So why add the confusion when the book of John does not want to confuse anybody by saying it's just believe on Christ, right? And then there was another one, a missionary that I met in Chile, right? He's like, yeah, you got to repent of your sins. And I, I met up with him, I challenged him on it. And he goes, Kevin, you know that I don't believe literally that someone has to stop sinning to be saved. You know, I'm not saying that, you know, an adulterer has to stop adultery to be saved. What I mean by repenting from sin is you know, well, what does repentance mean? To turn or to change, right? It means instead of me paying for my sins, I'm going to get Jesus to pay for my sins. And that's when I say repent of your sins, I mean that I'm giving those sins to Jesus to take care of on the cross so I don't have to pay for it. That's what I mean, right? So he's really saying, I'm putting all my faith on Jesus. He's paying for my sins. You know, he's saved. But he's so fixed on, on using that term. And I think I know why. Because as a missionary, you go around to hundreds of churches trying to get financial support. And guess which churches you're knocking on? Those that teach is faith alone and church that teach that it's repenting your sins. So you kind of have to, oh, let me just make everyone happy, you know. That's what's happening. The next one, I think I'm going a bit long. Trish said, don't apologize, Kevin, if you go long. So if, if, if you're not happy that I've gone long, blame Trish. <laughs> the next one is, I'll be quick with the other ones. Be willing to turn from your sins. You don't actually have to turn from your sins. You just have to be willing to do it. What does that mean? What does that mean? Do, do I, you know, do I go to, you know, if, do I get up in the morning and instead of going to work, I'm just willing to go to work. You know, that'll pay for the bills. You know, that'll take care of everything. Honey, I'm willing to go. What does that mean? Does that mean you promise God, God, I'm going to turn from my sins. I'm willing to do it. But you, but you know, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's not. 
Anyway, John 1, 12, let me give you a Bible verse. But as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which are born of God, sorry, which, are, sorry, which were born, verse 13, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So you cannot be born by your will, your willingness to do anything. No, it's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's like, no, it's your heart. God knows your heart. God knows you're willing to turn from your sins. I spoke about this briefly on Thursday, but I got the verse better. I, I, I think I messed it up when I quoted it on Thursday. But Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, the heart, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You really want to stand before God? God, God knows my heart. It's desperately wicked. You want to stand next to God and present your heart to God, which is desperately wicked, and say, look, God, I want to serve you. Look, God, I'm willing to turn from my sins. God will say, it's desperately wicked. Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire. You really want that? Or do you want to just trust on Christ? It's perfection. And the other one I've heard is, well, repentance is to have sorrow. Sorrow for your sins. <clears throat> now, should you have sorrow for you? Of course you should have sorrow for your sins, right? But is, do you need to feel a certain emotion? Now we're starting to enter the realm of the Pentecostals, the Charismatics. You've got to have the right emotional experiences to really know that you're saved, right? But they'll say repentance is to have sorrow for your sins. And look, they've got verses, right? Let me share what they, what they tell you. And I already read this, Genesis 6, 6, the first mention of repentance says, And it repented the law that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him in the heart. So they say, see, first mention, you know, grieve, repentance, sorrow. See, repentance means sorrow. All right. And then the other thing they'll do is go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9 to 10. Yeah, actually, yeah, turn there, please. 2 Corinthians 7, uh, chapter 7, verse 9 to 10. It says this. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. And this is it. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. All right, so they'll say, see, sorrow, repentance. And all they're doing, guys, is they've gone to Bible software, search verse, one verse with the word repent and sorrow in it. That's what they've done. <laughs> and they found one, a couple of verses with sorrow and repentance or grieve and repentance. See, it means to be sorrow for sins. The verse, the verses aren't even saying that. <laughs> Have a look at it again. Verse number 10. In fact, this verse clearly tells us that repentance cannot be sorrow. It cannot be sorrow. Verse number 10. For godly sorrow, so we have godly sorrow, worketh, repentance so one thing leads to another in the context of this verse now first of all this verse and you can read it in context later on is not even about the salvation of the soul not even about that okay it's about the church this is the second letter that paul is writing to the corinthians the first letter paul had to rebuke them sharply for allowing great sin into their church and because of his letter because of the godly sorrow they received by reading that letter they repented but you see, the sorrow worked, worketh repentance. So repentance cannot mean sorrow because one leads to another. Let me give you another example of this. Romans 5, I'll just read it to you. Romans 5 verse 3. Now pay attention to this. Romans 5 verse 3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. Now, is he saying that tribulation is patience? No. Is he saying that patience is experience? No. Is he saying experience is hope? No. Is he saying tribulations is hope? No. Right? He's saying that tribulation worketh patience. One leads to the other. If you want to be someone that grows in patience, guess what? God's going to have to put you through a little bit of tribulation in your life. One leads to the other. And then patience leads to experience. And experience leads to hope. So none of these things are defining each, each, each other. It's just one leads to another, just like godly sorrow can lead you to repentance. Now the question is, and so look, the verses they use don't even line up. And, and in fact, they contradict what they're saying completely. Okay? But 
If someone says you've got to have sorrow in your heart, you know, that's what repentance means, and believe the gospel, are they adding works to the gospel? I would say they're not. Okay, because I don't, I don't believe emotions are a work. Okay, you can feel, but the thing is, people can feel all types of emotions. Some people might feel sorrow. You know, out of the five kids I've got that believed on Christ, two of them actually started crying. They started, really, they teared up. They, they felt like they had failed because they have sinned and they knew the destination was hell. They felt sorrow. But the other ones, once I heard, they're rejoicing, happy, relieved, right? You can go through any ranges of emotions. You don't have to feel a certain emotion to be saved. You just have to understand and believe the gospel, okay? So I don't believe emotions are a work. So I don't believe the people that say this are unsaved or, or bringing works into the gospel. But what they're doing afterwards is creating a lot of doubt for those that really did believe. Because then it'll be like, well, did I really, did I have enough sorrow? Did I sorrow? And was my sorrow enough? Was it genuine sorrow? It's like the repenting of your sins. Was I willing? Was I willing enough? I mean, you start just now creating doubt and people don't even know. They start looking at themselves. Have I sorrowed? Have I willed? Have I done? No, Jesus did it all. Right? Jesus did it all. Believe on Him. Trust Him. Amen. And so it takes away from looking at Christ and it becomes looking at yourself. Am I performing or have I performed the way you know, these preachers have told me that I should be? <clears throat> okay. Um, all right. I, I've got to cover all this, guys. Otherwise, I feel like I'm, I'm leaving it undone this sermon. So I'm sorry if I go a bit long. But be wise. Please never say to people, and I've seen these like on Facebook and things like that, people that believe like us, right? And then someone says, mentions the word repentance in, in salvation. They're like, oh, you're teaching works. You know, you don't have to repent to be saved. Of course you do. We believe you have to repent to be saved, right? We do believe that. We just don't believe you have to repent of your sins to be saved. Right? So just be wise. Be careful the way you speak. Um, also, just be mindful that not everybody... You know, I'm thinking of a deacon in one of my previous churches. Um, someone preached, you know, one of the laymen. Thank God. Someone preached that it's not repenting of your sins to be saved. And so it, started, it, it sparked discussion. And then I was talking to a deacon. The deacon said to me, um, of course you have to repent of your sins to be saved. So I asked him, well, what sins do you have to repent of? He thought about it. He goes, well, all the sins you're, you're aware of. So I said, hold on, if I'm, if I'm like, let's say me and another person, we're living with our girlfriends, and I know living with my girlfriend is a sin, but he doesn't know. I mean, look, people for, are fornicating throughout our nation all the time. It's so naturally, it's so accepted, it's so socially accepted, right? People don't even realize it's a sin, they don't know. People at least realize that adultery is a sin, right? Because they've, they've, they've sworn, um, you know, uh, they've promised, you know, to, to, to keep themselves to one spouse. But people today, fornication, they don't even realize that's a sin. Honestly, a lot of people just don't even know that. But if someone knows it's a sin, but someone doesn't know there is, it's a sin, does that mean the one that knows has to turn from that one, and the one that doesn't know has, that doesn't have to turn from it? Right? I mean, do you see how it starts now adding confusion? Because now you're saying, look, and my wife, she said to me, I didn't, until she got saved, she didn't even know what half her sins were, or maybe more. She knew what some were, but she didn't know until she started reading the Bible what the sins were. Right? So then he goes, oh, okay, it's not the ones, you don't actually have to, you don't actually have to really turn from any of your sins. You just have to realize you're a sinner. And I realize, yes, <laughs> you do have to realize you're a sinner. Because it's not till you realize that you're a sinner in the sight of God that you need a savior. You realize you need a savior. And so by his, do you see, do you see that he knew what the gospel was? Do you, do you realize that he knew, I just have to realize I'm, I'm a sinner before God. But then he thought by using the term repenting of sins is describing what he, what he believes. And so we need to be wise. Don't automatically think these people are just false prophets and false teachers. Many of them are just deceived, right? Many of them, you might say to me, Kevin, how do you determine what a false teacher is then? What's, what's, my, what's my criteria? Basically, there's two things. Number one, if they're just outright teaching, you've got to turn from fornication. You've got to stop your drunkenness. You've got to stop, you know, telling lies in order to be saved. It's at that point that they're just blatantly adding works to the gospel. They're not even being coy about it. They're just out there just telling you it's works. All right, that's when I just call out the false prophet. And the other one is when they mock believing on Christ. Yep. Just believe? Ha, ha, ha. Just believe on Christ? False prophet. Yep. Okay? Yep. And so that's, that's what I know. Everyone else, I'm, I'm a very easy per going person. I get along with a lot of people. I'm always willing to give people the benefit of the doubt. I always ask people to explain themselves if they say repent of your sins, right? But it's not till they mock or just openly say it's works. That's when I just, you're a false prophet, you know, and I'm, you know, I want nothing to do with that person. Now, here's some other things. Here's some other things people do. 
to define repentance. And this is where churches try to find a middle ground because there's a lot of churches out there that in the IFB movement and other churches where there are people in the congregation that know it's by faith alone. And then there's another group in the congregation that say, no, it's repent of your sins to be saved. You've got to repent of your sins to be saved. And so to, to keep the peace, this is how... And I've only, I've only heard this definition in the last, I don't know, five, ten years. It's not something I've ever heard before. But they'll say repentance is. This is how they define repentance now. Repentance is a change of mind. Correct. <laughs> but let me finish. Repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of heart that leads to a change of action. All right? Repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of heart that leads to a change of action. Now, is there anything wrong with what they've said? Not really. Because they haven't really told you anything. <laughs> they haven't really said anything, right? Because here's what's going to happen. The, the one that says you've got to turn from your sins, right? Keep the law. They'll be like, that's right. Turn from action means stop sinning. <laughs> right? That's how, they'll, that's how they'll think it. And then, and then the, uh, the one that says it's by faith alone, and I said, well, what? Is, this, you know, is, is this pastor preaching works? We'll go up to the preacher and say, well, are you saying you've got to keep the works to be saved? And the preacher will be like, did I say you have to keep the works? No, I said it's a change of action. So it's, it's, you've got to believe on Christ. That's a change of action, is it not? Believing on Christ. That's a verb. That's an action. Believing. Do you see how when... Usually when they, when they use this definition, they won't tell you what the change of mind is. They won't tell you what the change of heart is. They won't tell you what the change of action is. They'll just leave it out there. So that way people feel like that preacher agrees with me. <laughs> right? We're all in... And then, you know, the repent of your sins crowd, amen. And the faith alone crowd, amen. You know, great preaching. You know? <laughs> I haven't told you anything. <laughs> I haven't told you anything. Just be careful when you hear this. Don't automatically think the teaching works. Okay? Because, and again, be wise, because let me give you how our salvation, our gospel, the gospel of the Bible, can line up with these things. Number one, change of mind can be, uh, yep, I realize that my works, that my church, and my false religion cannot save me. That's a change of mind, right? Change of heart. Usually change of heart, people think of humility. It's like, well, since I can't save myself, that means only God can save me. Only God can save me through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's humility, right? Realizing that I can't save myself, only God can do it. That's a change of heart. And then the change of action. I place all my faith, I believe with all my heart that Jesus paid for my sins. I'm only trusting Jesus. And even, you know, calling upon the name of the Lord. That's an action. You know, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so please, don't, you know, be wise. Don't automatically think, that works. Because you're going to go there and you're going to sound foolish if you do that. But you need to ask them, Please tell me what it is. And if they're not willing to tell you what it is, you tell them what it is. You tell them that the change of action is that, um, but as many as, listen to this, John 1 verse 12, but as many as received him, action, to them gave you power to become, become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So there is an action that does take place when you put your faith on Christ. You receive Christ. You receive the free gift. You are taking action. And this is what I normally say to people that say this definition. I'll be, I'll, I would just tell them what I just told you. This is how I define it. Now, if you think the change of action is anything else but putting your faith in Christ, please tell me what that change of action is. All right? Because then th that's when they'll, then the, you know, if the teaching works, that's when it's going to come out. Yeah. Right? So people use this definition to appease both sides. Now, in conclusion, I'm wrapping up now, guys. Thank you for being patient and the kids as well. People will say, Kevin, you've changed on the gospel. You know, your churches in the past have taught repentance of your sins or whatever. You know, you don't believe the gospel. And I've had someone say and, and say, look, it's because you've heard Pastor Anderson. And I said this in my testimony. You've heard Pastor Anderson say that it's not repenting of your sins. And now you've gone his way. First of all, I got saved at a very young age, right? Uh, you know, I believed on Christ. That was it. You know, that's what I did. That's number one. But then, when I was 19 or 20, I can't remember how old I was when I first went, when I went to my first independent fundamental Baptist church. Okay? The church that I got baptized in. And what's baptism? You're associating with the death, burial, and resurrection. You're associating yourself uh, uh, publicly with the gospel that's been taught in that church. Right? Now, this is the statement of faith according to Bethany Baptist Church, the church that I, the first IFB church I got at, and the first one I got, or the one I got baptized in. This is their statement of faith. It says this, 
We believe that the blessings of salvation are made free to all without obligation of payment, that salvation is not earned or merited in, in part or in whole by works, rites or rituals, so it's not of works, that it is the immediate duty of all to accept salvation by a repentance of any trust in self or works. Remember what we said about trusting yourself, trusting your works? That's the repentance they're talking about. To merit God's forgiveness and to trust wholly and solely on the blood of Jesus Christ as the payment and full provision for the forgiveness of sin. That's what I'm teaching. I haven't changed. From the church that I got baptized in, I'm associating my faith with what was being taught there in the gospel. Not only that, but that church had a booklet at the back of the church for everyone to read called What About Repentance? And it's located on our church website, churchincalandra.org. I asked the one that wrote that if I could have permission to put it on my website. He said yes. So if you want the full thing, please read it. But let me just take a little bit out of this. This was the pastor at the time that he wrote this. He said, he wrote, We should not therefore be calling upon people to repent of their sins in order to be saved. This is unscriptural and confusing for the sinner. Later on he writes, Christians should be commanded to repent and do good works, meet for repentance. So Christians, don't lose track here, Christians should be commanded to repent and do works, meet for repentance. But to command a sinner to do this for salvation under the grace, and the grace is called another gospel. Amen. So the preacher that baptized me, that I heard the gospel in, that I identified with, knew that repentance of your sin was another gospel. Okay, I've not changed. Now, if that church has changed today, then they've changed, but I've not changed. All right, I've not changed. And then I went there for two years. Then I went to a church called Victory Baptist Church for nine years. Now, this is what their statement of faith says. We believe in salvation by grace through faith, that salvation is the free gift of God, neither merited nor secured in part or in whole by any virtue or work of man, but received only, but received only by personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in fact, in the whole statement of faith, the word repent doesn't even appear once. So if repenting from sins was a requirement for salvation, then the statement of faith would be in, insufficient and would not be true to the gospel, right? I'm just showing you, hey, that's, I've not changed. I've not changed. And then for the last two and a half years before starting this church, I was at the church in Punchbowl. This is the church in Punchbowl statement of faith on the gospel. We believe, or on repentance, I should say, we believe that repentance in regards to being saved is when a person turns from their unbelief and calls upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Turning from your sins is a good work believers should strive to do, but is not a requirement to be saved. Do you see the consistency of the gospel being taught in all these churches? I've basically taken that, that statement from the church in Punchbowl and I've added some words to it. This is what our statement of faith says. And, you know, I want you guys to be aligned with what we're teaching here. You know, if, if, you don't, if you're not aligned, please speak to me. But the statement of faith says this. We believe that repentance in regards to being saved is when a person turns from their unbelief or, this is what I've added, or stops trusting whatever else it was before they put their full trust and hope on Christ alone. Turning from your sins is a good work believers should strive to do, but it is not a requirement to be saved. Now, let me just say this. I promise you as the bishop of this church, that I will never allow anybody to stand behind this pulpit to preach a works-based gospel. I will never allow someone to stand behind this pulpit. They'd have to do it over my dead body. I'd have to die and you guys go nuts and just get someone else, right? Just anybody, right, to preach. I will not allow a false gospel. Now look, are people going to stand behind the pulpit and preach things that I might not fully agree with? Yes, it's going to happen, right? Because it's human nature. You know, we don't, we, none of us have full understanding of the scriptures. But this is, I'm going to, look, I'm drawing a line here, right? If someone comes and preaches another, and this is why I want, guys, this is why I want you guys to give your testimonies, right? Because I want you to test, I don't want you to just assume that everybody in the church is saved. I want you to hear it from their own mouth that they've put their full faith on Christ alone. That's, I want that to be, I would like that for everyone that's saved to say, you know, I, I know that's, some people don't like that. And, you know, I'm not going to, you know, if, if you, Look, it's for the church. It's not for YouTube. 
You know, if you're not comfortable with it being on YouTube, I won't put it on YouTube. It's for the church. It's for the body. It's for the congregation, okay? I want you guys to do that. And let's say by accident someone gets up here and says, I repented of my sins. Hey, that's, yes, that's wrong. But at least we know. <laughs> at least we know this person's messed up and we get them fixed, right? Yeah. Now, let me just say, if it just happens by mistake somehow that I allow someone to come in here and preach some pastor, some big name, who knows what. You know, I know I get fooled into getting this guy behind the pulpit and he teaches that you've got to repent of your sins to be saved. I'm just going to yell out, shut up and sit down. And if you don't hear me say it, it's because Callum's already said it. <laughs> right? I'm not going to allow another gospel, guys. Guys, this is all that matters. Saving, our, saving souls. Getting the right gospel. Preaching the right gospel. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You for Your Word. Lord, we thank You for salvation by grace through faith. Lord, I just want to thank You for the congregation here as well. They've been patient for a long sermon. And Lord, thank You for keeping the weather uh, good for us, Lord. Thank You for taking the rain away so we can just be gathered here, Lord, and just out in the open. This is fantastic, Lord. I wish we could do this more often, actually. Uh, but Lord, anyway, uh, Lord, we thank You for the provisions that You do give us. Lord, help us as we go out soul winning later on that we would be able to preach your word boldly, Lord, that we'd be able to correct anyone that thinks they have to repent of their sins to be saved. And Lord, also for the fellowship and lunch that we'll have together, Lord, I pray that you bless all that food to our bodies. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.